Okay, so with that, we're going to invite uh, Claudio Crishon up here. Um, he's going to close out GTAC for us with this last talk around uh, drinking the ocean, finding XSS at Google scale. Um, but I want to say one thing. He was a little intimidated by the Matrix uh, opening. He had his own skit, and then he sort of decided not to do it. So let's just give him a clap for being the last one up here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And so with that, Claudio. Thank you. Let's go drinking. Well, thank you. And thank you all for being here so late in the afternoon. Hopefully, you're not asleep yet. Uh, try to fix that. So um, uh, my name is Claudio Cruscione. I'm a security test engineer at Google. Um, I kind of like the title. The only issue I have with that, uh, it's kind of difficult to explain that to my mom. Uh, she seems to be quite convinced that engineers are supposed to build bridges. And for that reason, most of our conversations today look a bit like this, which is kind of sad. But I have to live with that. So on a more serious note, what do I actually do at Google? Well, uh, the sexy line is that I am a hacker, so I do security. Uh, the not so sexy line, and more truthful one, is that I look for bugs, and web bugs at that. Um, it turns out that the security web bugs, most of the times, are actually cross-site scripting, XSS. So before we delve a bit deeper into that, how many of you know what an XSS is? Raise your hand, please. OK. It's great. It's more or less what I was expecting. Uh, but just to be sure that everyone is on the same page, let's take a minute to go through what an XSS is and how it works. So at a very high level, an XSS vulnerability happens when an attacker can execute its own JavaScript, is, uh, JavaScript controls, really, inside a victim's browser in the context of a vulnerable web application. Now, how this looks like in the real world is more or less like this. So you have the attacker. You can tell it's evil. Um, that is sending a link to a user, which for some reason has his monitor filled with coke. Um, the user will now click on the link, and it will end up on a vulnerable application. Now, what will happen at this point, at least in the most classical of XSS, is that the application will process this request, and the request will contain a payload, the evil JavaScript that the attacker crafted. And this payload will be issued back to the user, and its browser will have no way to know if the JavaScript that it's receiving is a good one or the bad one that the attacker injected. So it will execute it, and it will turn into a puppet owned by the attacker. Now, how does this look like from a code perspective, which is a bit more interesting? Well, you mainly have two families of XSSs. The first one is the one you have on top. It's the old school XSS, if you want. It's the most classical one. There is a request, and the server, this is a Java snippet, very lame Java snippet, sorry, it's my code, I, I, you can see. Um, the request uh, is taken as an input from the server, processed, and sent back to the user. Classical XSS. Now, of course, it can be a number of sources. It doesn't have to be the request. It can be a database, but it doesn't really matter in our model. The second one is the most interesting one. It's new school XSS. Everything there happens inside the browser. As you can see, the payload there lives inside the document.location.ash, which is the part of the URL after the hashtag that is never sent to the server. So you don't even see it happening from a server perspective. And then it gets each read back inside the DOM and executed through the inner HTML statement. Now, keep this in mind while we go through this presentation. It's going to be useful. Whenever I talk about these two specific examples with my mom, which we do every week on Friday, uh, she usually has a um, complaint. She says, come on, this is not something that happens at Google, right? I mean, it's just an excuse for you to play games, stuff like that. Um, it turns out that, yes, it does happen at Google as well. 70% roughly of the, ex of the security bugs that we observe are XSS. So this is a huge problem. Um, however, this is a pie chart. And as you know, pie charts are never truthful. Um, in this specific case, the data is from the Vulnerability Reward Program. What is the VRP Vulnerability Reward Program? It's one of the many initiatives that Google has to make uh, our application more secure. The core idea is that we reward researchers for finding bugs. So they keep finding security bugs. They tell us about that. We fix them. And our applications are eventually more secure. Now, we awarded around $800,000 in the web program alone. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of bugs. So it is a real problem. And people out there are testing and looking for it. And that's why this presentation would be about how we try to fix this thing at a scale, at Google scale. But before we get there, how are these people actually looking for XSSs? 
There are a number of techniques out there in the community industry and the academia on how to test for XSS. Most of them don't work, or at least work in a very specific, narrow case that is good enough to take, have a paper out, but they don't work in the real world. So what we, what we actually observed is that what works is the Christmas Eve uh, approach. So you know when you were a kid, um, you had to wait to unwrap the, the, all the presents that were lying under the Christmas tree. And before that, you wanted to know what was inside. So you took the present you know, and shaked it, trying to figure out what was inside. This is pretty much the same approach that we have. We try to listen to the sound of the application to figure out if an XSS is there. So today, one of the most effective ways to test for XSS is just fuzzing. We send a test attack in, which contains a JavaScript payload. Then we look at the response from the server, and if the payload is there, chances are there is an XSS. Well, it's actually quite reasonable that there is an XSS. The payload shows up. Now, this approach has many shortcomings, but at least for me, the main shortcoming is that if you spend your entire day looking for XSS like this, so every parameter, every page, every application, manually going through, um, at the end of the day, you look more or less like this. That's me after a day testing for XSS. Bad, you don't want to do that. So you want to come up with a better solution. And this talk, it's about the, the travel, the, our journey, in building a security testing tool that could test for XSS at Google Scale. OK. So what are the four main points that I'd like to get across? And those are the four requirements that we had when we, set, we started building our testing tools. Well, the first one was that we wanted to build a false positive free testing tool. This is extremely important with security, because if you report a security bug, people are going to fix it very quickly and be very worried about that. And you can only report false positives so many times before they start ignoring your bug. Um, in the talk before mine, we, we saw how important it is to report truthful things when you deal with security. And yeah, it is extremely true. The second problem, of course, was scalability. Most of the security testing tools out there cannot cope with the sheer size of volume of pages that we have at Google. And finally, we wanted it to be completely automated and possibly usable by normal human beings, not just security engineers. So let's start with the first one, false positive free. How hard can it be? Well, the basic approach that you can have is that you just grab the HTML that gets sent back from the server. Remember, request, server sends back response. You grab through the HTML, and you find out if the payload is there. It turns out this doesn't quite work. Consider this, approach, this uh, situation where you have a no script tag and your payload ends inside the no script tag. Well, this is complete false positive, unless you can prove that you can escape from the no script tag, because that JavaScript is never going to execute. So no, doesn't work. You go back to the drawing board, and you build something better. You build something that has some contextual understanding of HTML, that can actually parse HTML and identify when the payload is ending in a part of the code that is going to be executed. Well. Not enough. You can now understand that you're inside JavaScript, but you need to understand exactly what JavaScript is doing to, to understand if your payload is going to be executed, so if a XSS bug is there. In this case, for instance, we ended up inside a JavaScript string. So unless we can escape out, OK, this is not a bug. If you report that to a developer, it will say, yeah, sure. Not, not real bug. So again, back to the drawing board. And now you need to understand HTML and full JavaScript syntax. Not a lot of fun, but you can code it, and it will work. At this point, you're more or less cap capable of identifying XSS with no real false positive, because you understand it HTML, you understand um, JavaScript, so fine enough. The problem with this is that you're not going to find a lot of XSSs, because modern web applications look more or less like this. There are a small block of HTML, and then two big JavaScript components that do all the, the work for you. So, in order to be able to look for your payload there, you need to download the JavaScript, execute them, and then look it through the DOM with the um, um, technology that we just discussed about. So you have to do better. You have now to build something that understands JavaScript, executes it, uh, considers the DOM, and so on. We went through all this in very nice pipeline, and we ended up with something more or less like this. A bunch of components glued together. Or remote. So back to the drawing board, need to be better. You need to scale. This, this doesn't scale at all. So we figured out that if you have HTML, DOM, JavaScript, and whatnot, I mean, this looks a lot like a browser, right? And it turns out that we are also building a browser. So why not? Let's use a browser. A very long story to get uh, at the end to using Chrome. Fine. How do we use it, though? Because, yeah, you use Chrome. But of course, the most natural approach 
is instrumenting the browser and look through the parsing code of the browser. And if your payload shows up, good. Well, it's very hard. The parsing code is extremely optimized. It changes with an incredible speed, of course, because of the fantastic job of our de developers. So you can do that, but it's really hard. And we didn't feel like starting doing that. So we took the usual approach, and sorry, we took a different approach, and we tried to look at the problem from another perspective. So, so far, we've been discussing about detecting the presence of a payload, and from there, deriving the presence of a bug. How about instead, we try to actually exercise the bug, actually exploit the bug, and detect the results of that exploitation? Well, it turns out that this more or less works. The way we have taken is to inject a JavaScript function inside the browser, so instrument the browser, add a function, and call back the function. And if the function gets called back, it means that the payload which contained the callback has been executed, so there is an XSS in the page, and there is really little chance that this is a false positive, right? True. Again, if you try to do that, actually, out there, it turns out that stuff breaks. If you inject arbitrary JavaScript into arbitrary pages, uh, some websites won't like it. Some applications will not like it. So, okay, again, it doesn't work. It was getting frustrating at this point. So we went back, and we tried to find a better way. This time, it's an easy one. There is a functionality in Chrome which is very handful. Uh, we can use that functionality to call back outside the context of the page. And we can also monitor for calls to that functionality. What is that? Well, the debugger, as easy as that. So the way we finally managed to detect XSS is with basically zero false positive. I get back to that later. Is by hooking a debugger. So through an extension, we hook inside the debugger. We then use a debugger call as our payload. So not any random JavaScript, but an actual call to the debugger. We load the page, and if we get a callback, breakpoint, okay, that's an XSS. It's extremely unlikely that you will find the bugger calls in production code. Now, I said close to false positive free. Uh, there was one case that one developer left a bugger call into production code. Now, I'm pretty sure that he did it on purpose, so they couldn't say that our approach was completely false positive free. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure of that. I'm looking for you. I will find out. But at the end of the day, this works. Now, there is a lot more to this, but this is the sex interesting part, using an out-of-band detection model to get XSS with, false positive, with a complete false positive free approach. Now, for the second part, this was a lot of fun. Now, we actually had to scale this approach, because now we ended up having Chrome as our detecting mechani detection mechanism, and we had to scale this to all of Google. Hey, good luck with that. It's an interesting challenge. Well, it turns out, it's not that difficult if you think about that, because Google has a lot of ways to scale things. So we used all publicly available, or less, technology to scale our approach. App Engine for the web interface. We used the Google Compute Engine uh, to start virtual machines and run a army of Chrome workers that will then swarm over an application and test it. The key intuition there was to use a pull task queue um, a feature available in App Engine to split every single scan into smaller tasks. This is a common approach in web testing, right? You split a huge job and then you just spread it over a bunch of workers, and this is what we have done. And in the process, we also managed to play with some of the interesting techniques, uh, technologies that we didn't have the chance to work with before. So with this approach, we scaled to some thousands of workers, and we can now scan most of the static pages throughout less than one night at this point, which is pretty good. How about the third point? This is an interesting one I like to spend some time on. Automation. So if you think about automation, the Google mantra is really automate everything that you can possibly automate, right? We want to, ideally, we want the developer to click a button and something magical happens in one second and it gets the response back and it fixes bugs. This is the ideal word. We can detect XSSs with no human interaction, so it seems our job is pretty much done, right? Well, unfortunately, as it often happens when you're testing, you're doing web testing, you have to take care of coverage. Because yes, you can find XSSs, provided you can actually reach the page that has some XSSs inside. So this was a very big problem for us. The largest problem there, of course, is the nature of modern web applications. We were dealing with applications that didn't really care about being crawled, right? Gmail, why would you crawl Gmail, ideally? It, it, this has not been designed with that in mind. So it's extremely hard to extract all those links inside the page and use them. 
and links are literally everywhere in modern web apps. Uh, XHR, uh, remote, um, sorry, uh, JavaScript execution, um, HTML5 features everywhere. Okay, we've been through this before, right? We need DOM, JavaScript, and so on. Let's use a browser and be done with it, and, and let's go home and have a beer, not a coffee. Um, turns out, no. Again, doesn't work. This is a very uh, well-established um, area of research, I believe. There are at least some prototypes out there that do complete uh, browser-based crawling. Now, if you try to scale that to the sizes that we needed it to scale, it just turns into something horribly slow, uh, flaky, and inefficient. Of course you can do it, but it turns out this is one of those few cases that we couldn't just throw hardware at the problem and solve it. It's a pity, because I would have loved it, but no, you can't do it. So we had to go back to the drawing board and find a better solution to make it faster, better, and so on. Well, it turns out that the solution in this case was in the nature of web application itself, at least the ones that we observed. If you look at them hard enough, you will start to recognize small clusters of pages. So these clusters are pages that are tightly linked by easily crawled links. Think about a menu that has all the links. Once you reach the menu, getting to the other pages is reasonably easy. From there, you can take some steps, non-click event, an interaction with a component, a JavaScript code, something like this, and you end up in another cluster of pages. Now, this is something that we didn't know, really know if it was true or not, but we sort of, it seemed reasonable, so we gave it a shot. In order to make this faster, we used two different tools. All the HTTP part, all the simple cluster part, you can pretty much crawl with existing tools that are insanely fast. In this case, we used Skipfish, which is a tool that was developed by two fellow uh, Googlers. It's a security scanner, and it's now open source, and it's insanely fast at crawling this kind of website. So we reuse that, seems reasonable. Then we recrawl those pages using a very lightweight approach, using our Chrome browser. And we keep doing that until we reach another cluster, and then again, Skipfish finds another bunch of pages, and we keep going until we think we covered the entire application. Fine, this approach seems to be reasonable, but of course, until you see it actually working, it's just words, right? So we gave it a shot, we implemented, tested, tried, and it turns out that even with this extremely simple approach, you can uh, augment the number of URLs you mine by at least two orders of magnitude, which is kind of cool. Of course, this doesn't tell you much about the percentage of application that you cover. That's a completely different problem, right? You might as well still be missing links. But in a, a comparison of sheer volume of URLs that you are finding, is it still a win? Now, keep, take the numbers with a grain of salt, because of course there might be some degree of the application, and the initial numbers of URLs that you're gonna mine from Gmail with just an HTTP crawler is not that exciting. So it's easy to do better. Still, it's better with a very, 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 very limited effort. So we managed to crawl in a very simple way, combine HTTP with um, Chrome, sorry, browser-based crawling, and get some very interesting results. What else did we do? Well, the last point was, at least for me, the main takeaway of this entire project. There was a big team behind this effort that I had the pleasure to work with, and there still is. Um, I think the main takeaway I had was that security people cannot possibly design any kind of interface. It's just over their capabilities. It's not doable. Most of the interfaces and the tools that security people have designed look a bit, look a bit like this thing, right? It's a coffee pot for masochists. <laughs> it's just horrible. And, and often they don't even realize that. You ask them, why, are, why, don't you, why, why don't you make something better? Why? Isn't 25 flags command line argument not good enough? Yeah, sure. So we didn't actually do that. We asked for a UX expert to help us, and he did an amazing job, I believe. But why did we actually care? Because no one else did before, so why did we? Well, I think solving the scalability problem is only half of, of the issue. Um, if you can scale and scan thousands of millions of URLs starting from just one, you still have to have someone that gives you the, that first URL and then looks through the results and fix them. So you need to have users. And it turns out, at least this is what our experience internally uh, teach us, that unless you make a tool usable, easy, and I was going to say appealing, but that is wrong. Uh, appealing to the um, users, they simply won't use it. Our end goal was to give this tool to product teams, 
not security, because that's how you scale. Security people, uh, despite being very vociferous, are only a limited amount, so they can't really scale. And you don't really want to be the human factor, the bottleneck of your system. So we ended up with an interface that is incredibly simple. Uh, you literally only have to enter the name of the scan and a bunch of target URLs and a couple more details like authentication if you really care about that, but we figured that out automatically. And then we just go and do our things and we get back to you with the results. And that's literally it. There is nothing else that the user has to worry about. And since the results are supposed to be false positive free, they are, then you just go and fix the bugs and that's it. So if you slept so far, time to wake up and it's summary time. There were four things that um, we went through during this very short talk about security. It's really exciting to talk about security to testing people because I think they care even more, the security people. That's a different story. So the first thing we did is we leveraged the browser to exploit bugs instead of just detecting them. The second thing, we scaled the infrastructure using publicly available technology, uh, Google's technology at that, and the core intuition there was to, score, to scale horizontally even through a single uh, scan. Finally, we proved, at least in our empirical tests on Google applications, that by simply combining HTTP-based and browser crawling, you're, you're able to find a lot more targets. One word on this, why do I say URLs and not states? Because most web application testing, you care about states of the app, right? So you click, the URL, the URL doesn't change, but the application is different. Well, that is true. But from an attacker perspective, what you care about is URLs. Because you want to have a URL that you fudge and send to someone. If you have to instruct that someone to go to a page and then click on a button, and then spin three times on a spot, and then click on another button, this attack is not going to work. You might just as well ask him to execute uh, the, the binary or type JavaScript in the URL bar. So too complicated. We're after stuff that the attacker will actually use. Finally, we really, really wanted hard to build a self-service tool that could have been used by people outside of security, not just the security team, but the product teams. And I think if there has to be one takeaway, it's exactly that one. This is something that we learned from the testing people. We learned that you have to give developers no excuse to write tests. Well, it's the same for security. You have to make it so easy that there is no excuse not to, use, not to do it, not to run the tests. So when you go back to your organization, Talk with the friendly security experts there. They are people too. Give them a big kiss and try to talk with them and figure out how you can help them scale the testing that they do. Because most of the time, there are a lot of lessons that they can learn from the testing community on how to scale uh, their approach, just like we did. That was all for my talk. A big thank you to the organization and everyone who has stayed so late and the amazing team that made this all possible. I forgot the name of the UX expert, so I'm going to call, out, call him out explicitly. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it, you did an amazing job at that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. That was fantastic. Uh, I mean, I like every talk that we've had so far, I learned two really important things. <laughs> One, uh, I'm never going to buy a coffee pot from Claudio. And two, if I don't fix my security bugs, he's going to kiss me. So I'm, I'm definitely getting to work. So. <laughs> um, so with that, I can see some uh, uh, questions are, are getting formed here. So why don't we go ahead and take a question right here. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Jacek Maciejewski from Cognified Poland. I wanted to ask, because there are many you know, security scanners available on the market, but they are set to detect only the basic bugs. And it is said that... Uh, human inspection is always recommended. So I wanted to ask if all the bugs you find with your tool or if some bugs are being found by a, by a human, by manual inspection. Is, is the your tool like 100% replacement uh, for, for a human inspection? Uh, as much as I'd like to say yes, uh, the answer, of course, is no. Uh, the, end, the end goal of our team is to replace the entire security team at Google with tiny PHP scripts, but I can't say that too loud. Um, so uh, as a matter of fact, there are always uh, corner cases and complex and difficult to find bugs. So yes, human interaction. Uh, these security experts are not going to lose their job because of the tool. But I think if we can find the majority of simple, low-hanging fruits, we can raise the bar. That's the key in security. Raise the bar for the attacker to find bugs to exploit. Great. Yeah, thanks for that question. Looks like we have another one over here. But there you go. Thank you. 
Uh, All right, so please. How do you deal with authentication? Like in your endpoint, I just say go to gmail.com. How do you deal with logging in and stuff like that? Well, um, we build this with, uh, from day one uh, with Google in mind. Mm -hmm. So m all of the Google authentication mechanism are built in, in, in the application. We can support more. One of the many things that we have that I didn't really get to talk about is we have a Chrome plugin that you can install in Chrome and then we'll send the authentication details, of course, of a testing account to the application so that we can test. But in general, yes, that's, that's a very, very difficult problem that, that we think we solved a bit better than the others because we, we knew exactly what we wanted to fix. That helps. Great, thank you. Um, Name, where you work, and your question, please. Yeah, Eran from the Browser Infrastructure Team at Google. So how about using um, existing like core driver tests that a lot of teams in Google have uh, sort of to source the initial URLs or maybe to do something smarter? That's, that's a great question. So um, yes, that's the answer. Um, we, we want to do that. In general, we had an history of trying to source the URLs from end-to-end -end tests. This is what usually provides a lot of URLs. We found it a bit difficult because of the um, structure of URLs in testing environments. Often they lack things like access ref protection and so on, so they're a bit hard to use. But yes, this is definitely a good thing and we're trying to do that. We're not quite there yet, but yes, we, we like to do that and people should do that. I think using end-to-end -end tests for security is a fantastic idea. Thanks. Great, thank you. I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll take one question from the moderator here. It says, uh, is the XS tool going to be released as open source? Uh, and can you exclude URLs as part of setting up the tool, i.e. URLs that point to places you don't want them to point? So um, I start by the second one. Um, of course, excluding URLs is easy. Um, we can do that. And I think most of the tools out there can do that. So yes. It's a bit more challenging to know when you're having side effects. So when you're hitting URL 1, and that causes something else to happen on URL B. Uh, that's kind of difficult to figure out, so we didn't, we didn't do that just yet. About the open sourcing, I think a lot of the code there can be, and probably will be, open sourced. I'm not entirely sure about the entirety of the project, because there are, of course, many things that are very Google-specific. I think the core ideas uh, will we'll try really hard to get them out there uh, in, together with the code to support them as we did with other testing tools. Great. Um, with that, Claudio, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. I was wondering, actually, if this was his, his wife or not, actually. <laughs> um, so it's my job to say uh, thank you to everybody um, and to sort of recap what we've you know, all seen and heard. Hopefully, we accomplished what we wanted. We got everybody in the community talking to everybody else. Uh, I hope you took at least a dozen things away um, from the, you know, your conversations, your connections, people that you've met. Um, I know I certainly have. Uh, the talks today were just, I, I, was, I thought they were fantastic, all the way right up to, you know, Claudio is here at the end. Um, it was it was great, you know, having you know Jonathan talking about Appium and how he's trying to solve like this multi-platform problem and how it's getting pushed open source. Seeing you know Avet and Brendan talking about you know data and how it impacts you know media and like how they're trying to you know present these well-rendered maps. Um, yeah, there were just so many great talks. I, I I you know I would love to go through all of them, but they were just fantastic. Um, with that, I would actually like to say thank you to some people. Um, there's often many unsung heroes to pull together, you know, a event like this. Um, so I wanted to, to give a shout out to the uh, guys in, who have been running all of the live streams and all the capture and everything. They're over here in the far uh, left corner from me. So thank you. Uh, I would like to say thank you to the to our transcribers who I have noticed. Even if we use bad English, they actually fix it for us. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, we have had our, our signers here the whole time, um, you know, helping to you know, bring everybody in uh, into the, the conference. So thank you for all of your great sign language. Um, our catering department, I don't know, lunch and everything seems to have showed up in a great, it was fantastic, so thank you um, to them. 
And the last thank you I'd like to give is to all of the organizers. And you know, name attribution is, is very tricky. So I just try to capture a lot of pictures. And so all the pictures and everything that you see are the, the people who have contributed everything from you know, speaker selection to sending notices to you know, helping make sure that you know, we got here and got what we needed. So to all of the contributors, to my fellow Googlers and beyond, thank you very much. Um, and with that, one thing I was going to try is I was going to ask all of the speakers that spoke to come up on stage, and we were going to try to get a big group photo. Um, you're welcome to stay for that. If you want to, that's great. Otherwise, you can meet us in the lobby if you'd like to grab a drink with all of us. Um, we're going to do the same thing as yesterday, go up to Water Tower and have a drink and celebrate uh, hopefully what was what you have all at least told us is a fantastic GTAC, so thank you for all of your participation. And with that, I'll have the speakers come up, and if you want to stay, great. Otherwise, uh, head upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>